the fact that Woods Hole is not in uh, Cambridge and uh, that, it, that it is um, 70, 80 miles from, from Boston, from Providence, um, that had a lot to do with how this library grew um, because people came here for the whole summer and they were not, they were not casually uh, arriving here and then leaving later in the day. Um, so it was necessary for this library to develop um, very much similar to how the, li the library at the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard developed. We're very similar libraries. Um, nowadays, there would be only a need for one library, but, but because of the times that the libraries developed, uh, there needed to be two very similar libraries um, an hour and a half apart from each other. Um, over the years, through, through uh, contributions and gifts and so on, we, we, we amassed the, the makings of a, a rare books facility. There's amazing volumes having to do with, with, uh, with uh, the voyages of exploration, um, the early oceanographic voyages of exp exploration. What I find unique are, are those, um, those one-off journals that may still be tucked in the stacks. Um, and one of my favorites is, uh, is the Bulletin of the Conchological Society of Brooklyn, New York, which is just this thin, it had a very thin life of, of maybe four or five issues, uh, and it's all about the mollusks that are found in the backyards of, of Brooklyn, New York. There are all the journals that came out of um, colonial territories, um, which, which one of the aspects of the biodiver or work in the Biodiversity Heritage Library that's been really interesting is that we've digitized a lot of those colonial journals and at the same time we, um, we have established relationships with the post-colonial current um, uh, libraries in those countries and so that's, that's sort of a unique thing that I don't think anybody would have thought about 50 or 60 years ago. You know, the library was used very differently um, 40 and 50 years ago. Um, let's say before Xerox machines and, and, and of course before digitization. The library was really um, a vital aspect to the day-to-day -day lives of individuals. Um, and you go back there and you open up journals and they're just shredded, essentially. And that, that's a testament to how, how the library was used. Um, the library is used very differently now. Of course, it's used, for the most part, electronically. Um, but uh, but there are young people, there are young scientists who see a value in certain parts of the collection um, that, are, that are in print and are, are still there um, for various reasons. Yes, things have changed a lot at MBL. Things have changed a, a great deal at, at MBL. Um, so the last 10 years of, uh, at MBL, uh, as somebody who works here, things have changed dramatically um, uh, because, number one, of course, because of the affiliation with the University of Chicago. Um, and because, uh, and that has, that brought about a change in the corporate makeup of MBL. And so uh, there is, uh, there was always this sense of, MBL being incredibly local. Um, MBL was run by the local group of scientists. Um, and my understanding is that uh, for all sorts of reasons that uh, going into the 21st century um, and all the financial issues that that, that involved, 
um, and all of the technical issues, the technical issues having to do with how science is performed, that MBL really needed more of a foundation in order to move ahead. Um, and so that brought about the relationship with the University of Chicago. When I first came here, everybody knew everyone uh, who worked here. Um, and, and maybe it will be the same in the future, but, but uh, with all the change that's taken place at MBL, it's, it's less so now. And so you have to work harder to, to get to know people. Um, and so it's, it's, it's not a completely local organization anymore. Um, and uh, the people who ran, the scientists who ran the MBL, that, that generation is, is no longer around. And so, and so you really do feel profound change here. Um, and you do get a sense, you do get a sense of, of there being a positive future here. Sure, that's sort of the, the, how this project that you're working on, uh, the, first, the first year of that was, I guess, three years ago. And uh, at that point, uh, right now, the MBL side of the library is four people. Um, at, at that point, MBL had created the Center for Library and Informatics. Uh, plus, MBL was very involved in the technical aspects, the development aspects of the Encyclop Encyclopedia of Life. Um, so there were all sorts of um, projects in support of science, but also projects which were, which were um, uh, uh, developing different digital tools. Um, that scientists could use, but developing different library tools, uh, visualization tools, and, and so on. And uh, at the same time, MBL's 130th birth 125th birthday was, was about to happen. And, uh, and uh, uh, I was working. Uh, and I still work as a volunteer in a, in a project uh, that's part of uh, the archives of uh, the University of Massachusetts in Boston. Um, that's called the Mass Memory, Memories Project, which is a project for the past 15 years or so has gone around to communities in Massachusetts. And on a single day um, in a single community, they invite people in to bring their photographs of their lives and and uh, and uh, they do exactly what you're doing with me right now they create videos about about people's lives um, and so as as MBL was coming into its hundred 25th birth, birthday um, I spoke with with uh, your advisor Jane uh, Mindshine and uh, I told her about the Mass Mem Memories Project and, uh, and that I thought that we should do something like that for one afternoon. Um, and uh, actually, I thought it should be for one afternoon, then the summer of MBL's 125th birthday, but it ended up, we did it as a whole summer project. Um, and so, uh, so that's what we did during that summer. We invited, with, with your colleagues, we invited people to come in and bring their, bring their photographs and so on and, and, and uh, conducted interviews with them. And that was the beginning of the, M the history of MBL website. Um, and at the same time, uh, the, uh, the archives here at MBL st started working with you guys doing digitizing documents, digitizing photographs. Um, and creating an online presence for for the history of MBL, uh, so um, so we had fun. We tried to drum up uh, buzz about it that summer, and and and, uh, 
And uh, we marched in the MBL Fourth of July parade. Um, and so I guess it was, a, it was the community archives project was a cool way to, to get the, to move the history of MBL into, or to begin to move the history of MBL into a place of where actual things were taking place um, on, a, on a more public, uh, in a more public way in the community. Do I think the MBL is a special place? Yeah, it is, a, of course, it is a special place. It is a, uni a unique place. Um, so what makes it unique? Um, it's, it's all about the young scientists. Um, it's all about the education. Um, uh, it's all about um, recreating the excitement that the first scientists who came here, who weren't even all scientists, uh, experienced. Um, and I hear that that through uh, the kids who come here in the summers are um, they are just uh, transformed by the the physical environment and by the challenges that that they're given um, and so when I have the opportunity to interact with with those young people, um, whether it be, be giving a tour of the library or helping them with their research, um, it is something that makes me think that the MBL is a unique place. For many other reasons, MBL is also unique. It's unique also because of all of the institutions in Woods Hole, um, the Oceanographic Institution, NOAA, um, and uh, um, the Sea Education Association, the Woods Hole Research Center. Um, you know, why should all of these institutions still remain so active in this village? Um, uh, that's because they all, uh, even if they're not interacting with each other, they're interact interacting with each other on a very, uh, on, a, on a level where you sometimes read the newspaper and you see that. Um, or hear it on the radio or television. Um, uh, from what I understand, one thing that's never changed in Woods Hole is, is, is the unique opportunities that scientists have to, to communicate with each other. One thing I remember growing up here, um, it has to do with a lot of things that I've spoken about here. Um, that have to do with the passage of time and how things were a certain way 40 years ago and they're not that way now. Um, uh, when uh, Russian scientific vessels came here in the, in the 1970s and you'd get these Russian scientists and crew, crewmen coming off the ships uh, into this, this uh, idyllic summer community and they'd come onto the beach and everybody would kind of look at each other and and start communicating and and not trading anything uh, with money but um, bartering things like cigarettes and and watches and 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 uh, um, I remember that was really cool it really um, it really spoke to how insular communities were um, back in the 60s and 70s. This was quite unique, um, and it was a lot of fun. And, and uh, unique relationships were formed when Russian Chinese scient when Chinese scientists came. Also, when it was when it was a time that that, that wasn't an everyday occurrence.